cameras are on us. We need to try and behave like a holy man. Uh, we are here on Google Plus. Less than 10 days after I preached, I was signing a contract in Hollywood. What's missing is not the intelligence, but the intent, the desire to change things. As long as we are confined to one planet, the survival of our species will always be in question. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the executive chairman of Google, Eric Schmidt. Thank you. Thank you so, thank you so very, very much. Madam Chancellor, Madam President, Ms. Minister President, Mr. Kempf, German and Brazilian ministers, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to be here. I want to talk about the future. And depending on whom we're talking about, the future looks very different. And there's more than one future that awaits. We're gathered here to talk about trust in technology, but that trust can only exist if the technology arrives in the first place. Now, last year, the population of the world reached a, a new record, 7 billion. But the number of people online is only two. And just one billion people have smartphones, like this one. And the World Wide Web has yet to live up to its name. So when we talk about the power of technology, we need to be realists. Every revolution begins with a small group of people. Imagine how much better the web would be if another five billion people came online. More innovation, more creativity, more opportunity. The past decade has taught us that if you connect people with information, they will change the world. And the problem, of course, is that as technology develops, another kind of digital divide will emerge. And that's what I want to talk about today. There's a, there's a first group, which I'm going to call the privileged few. And, and this, fir this first future belongs to the ultra-connected people. That's pretty much us everyone in this room, the early adopters, the computer scientists, the developers, the startup founders. They tend to be the lucky few, an unrepresentative minority who mostly start with big advantages in life, a good education, economic prosperity, democratic government, or lucky birth. For this group, the future offers only what the limits of science can deliver and society deems ethical. Pretty amazing. We know that Moore's Law, for example, which says that doubling computing power every two years or so will still hold true. And we know that the cost of computer storage per gigabyte is having every 14 months. So we can look forward to a future of unlimited speed and processing power. It's a great opportunity for Brazil, for Germany, for all of us. The cost of microchips will, and hard drives will fall to less than a dollar or a euro apiece. Tiny, powerful sensors will be embedded in everything from clothes to furniture. A new intelligent infrastructure will emerge. And by 2020, fiber networks, some of which are already here in the, in the Republic, um, will be deployed in almost every city, uh, delivering peak speeds of a gigabit per second and 300 to 500 megahertz megabits uh, per second sustained a perf performance. Go to Korea or Japan where those networks are already being built, and it's life-changing. We're already seeing science fiction become reality today thanks to these changes. Think back to Star Trek, or my favorite, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Much of what, Matt, what those writers imagined is now possible. Translation, German to English, or vice versa. Portuguese to German to English. Voice recognition, right? Listening to my voice, translating it perfectly. Electronic books. The people who predict that intelligent robots, 
virtual reality and self-driving cars that will be soon be commonplace are right. These technological advantages will redefine the way we live and the way we interact with each other. Driverless cars. Now, here in Germany, people love to drive, and they like to drive very fast. Imagine being driven very fast by your car. Google's cars, for example, have already driven over 200,000 miles, and other companies and research institutions, including leading ones here in Germany, are doing groundbreaking work in this field. In America, states like Nevada, Florida, and California are now changing the law to make all of this possible. And the biggest issue, of course, in Germany is how do we set the speed limit on the Autobahn for our automatic cars? We'll have to discuss that um, as these things become possible. The trend of big data in computing allows society to gain greater insights into how people and communities will function. And in the com coming data, we'll see the triumph of real empirical data. And data will allow us to make huge breakthroughs. Governments, for example, you all are recovering from a terrible global economic crisis, as we all are, will be able to, to spot the economic makings of a crisis before they happen. And doctors will be able to accurately predict the outbreak of disease before everybody else sort of feels it. Cities and buildings will be designed using super accurate computer models which predict how crowds of people and vehicles will move and data will transform the way governments operate. Transparency will force bureaucrats and politicians to be more open in their decision making. But the ultimate decision, the ultimate achievement in all of this technology is that it will disappear. And I don't mean that technology will become less relevant. I mean it will become part of everyday life. That people will have to spend less time getting technology to work, worrying about which cables work with which computers or where your content is stored, because it will all be seamless. It will just be there. The web will be everything, and it will be nothing. It will be like electricity. There's another group that I want to talk about. Let me call them the connected contributors. Now, they're just below this group, this larger technological advanced community, the connected, if you will, contributors. This is a generation that grew up increasingly sophisticated technology as part of their daily lives, but born into household connected to broadband with multiple computers and equipped with skills and digital literacy to use them. But they're also the middle class, which means they cannot afford the same level of technology as this privileged few that I first talked about. This new technology will still open new worlds for the connected. Uh, as an example, think about holopresence. People, you'll be able to rent or borrow a mobile device in a specific location. You can use this holographic projector to project your appearance, to capture, to capture it real time in your own mobile device. You can watch a live video feed from a remote location. You'll be able to see and, fee and, and feel and hear and experience the sensation of touch thanks to the next generation of what is called haptic technology and even perhaps even smell thanks to synthetic scent technology. These are all things coming. Imagine being able to stand among the street performers in the grand market of Marrakesh in the heart of the Congo during a total eclipse, or in North Korea when the regime has its first election, or in Brazil at its most festive period. This technology will allow us to build new friendships as well and renew old ones. And you can choose your friends based on your interests, not because of your location. And with language translation, you don't even have to be able to speak the same language. That's the possibility for many, many people globally. You can live in Germany but play virtual soccer after, world, uh, after work in Brazil. You, if you have a good idea for a clothing line, you can leverage the cloud and uh, things we're talking about here at the conference to design outfits, contract with factories, establish a digital storefront, lease a physical space, take delivery, open for business, all within two days. In this century, computer science, which I represent, is more than just the science of computers. Coding is more than just writing programs. Tools like Speak to Tweet and Ushahidi, quickly designed to deal with extreme circumstances in crises, are perfect examples. By combining passion and talent, developers, many of whom are here at the conference, have created tools that are used by dissidents and activists all over the world to overcome government restrictions and barriers to freedom. Developers will very much be the engineers of human freedom. I've always believed that the web is more than a network of machines. 
It's a network of minds that's evolving into a collective intelligence, but more importantly, a global conscience. Look at the way people came together last year to help the victims of the Japanese earthquake. Today, that idea is being made real thanks to technology. And in moments of crisis and tragedy and joy, the web unites all of us in sentiment and in action. More and more, people have loyalty not just to a nation or a location, but to their friends and causes and interests, wherever they come from. And that will change everything for citizens, states, and society. There will not be barriers to imagination nor to our compassion. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing to think about. But although this group, the connected contributors, are a, they're a rapidly growing group, they are not, uh, they're not the majority of people. The, the majority of people are uh, this sort of next group that we need to actually work on. They are a rapidly growing group. They're, 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 they're still a minority. I don't know how to say it any other way. There's another future that awaits for, the, for this five billion. For many people, the web is scarce. In communities all over the world, there are only pockets of connectivity, digital oases in online deserts. These are people who live in the most remote regions of the world, and the internet has yet to arrive for them. In the next decade, there'll be big improvements in their digital infrastructure of the developing world. Wired networks will get faster and go farther. And in the coming years, the number of new data centers will boom, mostly in markets like Southeast Asia, Turkey, and China, where I just was. We cannot imagine, this, we, we cannot imagine however, the, the future simply by extrapolating our past. As data access arrives at scale among the, the, this aspiring majority, they're skipping dial-up modems, DSL lines, and broadband. They're going straight to smartphones. And the smartphone revolution, again represented here, will be universal. And a mobile experience, at least at the level of today, will be available to most everybody at a fraction of the price. As an example, in 12 years, handsets will be 20 times faster, which means that a phone that costs $400 or 400 euros will be available for $20 or 20 euros. For people living on a dollar a day, that will still be a big investment, but it will also be a strategic one. And mobile will change lives. Imagine in the future, our poor, the poorest in the world will have a supercomputer literally available to them with a really smart sidekick, all rolled into one. Phones will have powerful sensors and voice-activated input and real-time analysis to diagnose medical conditions, to help them encourage literacy and understanding, to detect air pollution and advise on environmental hazards. You name it, it'll be possible. We know that even nomadic people are willing to invest in technology like satellite dishes and televisions. So we can also assume this will be true of smartphones. And of course, having a smartphone is not enough to get you online. You'll still need a data connection. But smartphones don't have to talk to a central hub. They can just talk to each other, sharing data in a peer-to-peer -peer relationship without an intermediary. No one is suggesting, by the way, no one is suggesting that technology will transform the social and political e conditions of, e of communities. Technology does not produce miracles. But connectivity, even modest amounts, changes lives. It redefines the relationships between citizens and the state. Propaganda will be harder to sell to the public as citizens get constant access to mobile phones and social networks. As an example, when the Chinese government tried to curb reporting of a high-speed train crash last year, they were widely ridiculed by Chinese web users in spite of a highly sophisticated censorship system. It shows you that the, the people really spoke. The network will become, if you will, a, a digital watering hole, a place where everybody gathers and they hang out. And communities will be drawn closer together. The people who access networks can engage in shared experiences, regardless of physical obstacles. And in times of war and suffering, it will be impossible to ignore the voices that cry out for help. Think about the extraordinary pictures that come out of Syria every day. Assad's brutality on display for everyone to see. There will be fewer places for dictators to hide, and it will be far easier for communities to mobilize themselves against autocratic regimes. Here then, and I want to conclude by saying, this is the final lesson for the future. There will be elites. They won't have a monopoly on progress and opportunity. Technology will be a great leveler, 
Uh, the weak will be made strong, and those with nothing shall have something. When that happens, we, don't, we won't just trust in technology, we'll trust in the future. In some ways, we'll all become more equal. But what is more interesting to me, anyway, is the ways in which our differences will persist. In many ways, the gap between the top and the bottom will be larger, not smaller, than the divide today. Not at least because some governments will continue to control and restrict access to the web and new technology. Forty countries today engage in online censorship in some form, up from just four a decade ago. I think we'll see more of these efforts, but I think that they will fail. Because the internet and technology are like water, they'll find a way through. No, sense of, no system of censorship will, can ever be absolute. There will always be chinks, which, which clever, artful citizens will use to find information and organize to break free. We must now act to avoid the rise of a digital caste system. We're not all born into families with laptops and high-speed connections, but all of us are blessed with creativity and imagination and a capacity for innovation, regardless of where, of where we come from. Technology empowers by its very nature, and ensuring universal access to the cloud, to each other, to the world, we can create a global community of equals. Let's resolve to commit ourselves to building a world where everyone has a chance to be connected and enjoy a future of greater freedom and opportunity for all. If we do this right, we won't just be talking about this future at CBIT a decade from now. We, it will be a future we will all have a chance to live. I'm very excited about this possibility Thank you so much for inviting us, and congratulations on the great show to come. Thank you very much.